At the beginning of autumn 2014, cruiser Aurora went for another refit, a tenth in more than a hundred years of the ship's history. There wasn't anything special about her. Aurora was an ordinary cruiser of the time. Today, few remember the names of the other two ships of this class, while the story of Aurora is truly amazing. Her life was a chain of grandiose events and lucky circumstances that allowed her to survive and be preserved as she is now. The cruiser class that included Diana, Balada, and Aurora became unique. Why? Because it was the first Russian-built class. All three cruisers were laid down, built, and launched in the Russian Empire. At that time, it was more profitable for Russia to order ships abroad. Domestic shipyards required more time to complete the construction, and the cost was sometimes even higher than in Great Britain. One might think that the ship should have been ordered abroad, cheap, quick, and efficient. However, there was one problem. Great Britain was our main potential adversary. New protected cruiser Aurora and her sister ships, Diana and Pallada, were intended for two main tasks, operations on enemy supply lines, as well as reconnaissance and support within a squadron. We're now on the legendary cruiser Aurora, launched in 1900. The uniqueness of the ship lies in the fact that, having lived through three wars, she's still in commission of the Russian Navy. Ship's specifications. Length, 416 feet. Beam, 54 feet 12 inches. Total displacement, 6,897 tons. Draft, 20 feet 12 inches. The engine is the heart of any ship. Here we have a closed cycle steam power plant. Of the three machines, only one, driving the middle propeller, remained intact. It was built in 1900, but it is still operational. Main power plant. 24 Belleville boilers. Three three-cylinder triple expansion steam engines. Power output, 11,971 horsepower. Electric equipment. The rudder gear was electrically driven, but could also be actuated manually or with steam. We're now in the steering compartment of cruiser Aurora. It was used to manually shift the rudder blade and turn the ship around. One man alone could barely rotate the helm. To overcome the water resistance, the efforts of three men were needed. It is perfectly preserved and looks the way it did more than 100 years ago. Armor. Armored deck from 1.5 to 2.5 inches. Conning tower, 6 inches. At the end of the 19th century, good first-rate cruisers had the thickness of their conning tower armor equal to the caliber of their main guns. On Aurora, it was 6 inches. Armament at the beginning of the Russo-Japanese War. Eight cannon guns, caliber 6 inches. 24 cannon guns, caliber 3 inches. Three mine torpedo launchers, caliber 15 inches. Initially, the main armament of the ship consisted of eight Kanae guns with a caliber of 6 inches on the upper deck. Additionally, 24 guns with a caliber of 3 inches were installed on the gun deck. Before the cruise to the far east, optical sights were mounted on all guns. The thickness of the armor sheets on each gun is 1 inch. Maximum speed, 19.2 knots. Cruising range, 4,000 nautical miles at 10 knots. The construction of cruiser Aurora took six years. Quite a long period of time, one might say. But this is understandable. The industry in Russia was not as developed as somewhere like Great Britain. Initially, it was a project aimed at fighting against British merchant ships. However, while the cruiser was being constructed, a new enemy, the German Empire and its powerful navy, came to the stage. 
In addition, another geopolitical task arose, the military buildup of Japan and the development of its navy. This was the third geopolitical task, and there were only three ships under construction. To cover all these tasks, using only three ships was a challenge. That's why during her construction, the cruiser's purpose and classification were changed from time to time. Shortly after the commissioning trials in 1903, Aurora headed to the Pacific Ocean, accompanied by other ships in order to provide enforcement for the 1st Pacific Squadron of the Russian Empire. During that cruise, Aurora received the order to return to port due to the Russo-Japanese War that had commenced recently. Starting from the spring of 1904, the Second Pacific Squadron was formed. In autumn, the squadron was sent to the Far East under the command of Admiral Rojestvinsky. Aurora was part of the cruiser detachment that, in its turn, was part of the squadron. Now, she was to fulfill her duties as a scout ship. It was one of the most difficult voyages in naval history. The ships covered 18,000 miles over the course of 223 days. During this long voyage, Aurora called at a port only once, in Tangier. All other numerous instances of coaling took place right at sea. What is coaling? Immense heat, sweat, cold, dust covering all of your body. This could last for hours, or even days in the case of large ships. However, that wasn't the only problem. After coaling was finished, all surfaces had to be washed because all superstructure elements were literally coated with coal dust, which not only caused overheating, but also harmed the health of crew members. It was an ordeal for Russian sailors, who were northern people by character. On May the 27th, 1905, the Russian squadron was met by a Japanese fleet under the command of Admiral Togo at the Korea Strait. At 1349, the Battle of Tsushima commenced. The events progressed in a worst-case scenario. The Russian squadron was utterly defeated. Four brand-new battleships were sunk. Another one, Ariol, was heavily damaged and barely stayed afloat. Cruiser Aurora engaged in the battle 45 minutes after it started. In the company of other cruisers, she defended transport ships that were part of the squadron against the Japanese superior forces. Then she accompanied the line of Russian battleships. The Japanese pelted Aurora with fire. During the battle, the number of hits received by the cruiser amounted to almost 20. During the Battle of Tsushima, the ship fired about 2,000 shots and received 18 hits. Shells hit the smokestacks. They were riddled with small fragments. The first smokestack was barely holding up. It was hit by two shells that left breaches of more than 43 square feet each. Most shells hit the forward part of the ship. The biggest breach on the gun deck was about 21 square feet. The conning tower was hit twice, having broken the hammock netting and steel ladder. The fragments of the exploded shell flew into the conning tower. Four people were injured, and the ship commander, Captain Yegoriev, was fatally injured. 98 people died or were injured, a sixth of the crew. All main and secondary guns were damaged. However, the crew of cruiser Aurora kept their chins up. Three people worked at each boiler. One would open the doors, and two others would shovel the coal into it. During the Battle of Tsushima, 144 people were throwing coal into the boilers at temperatures of almost 200 degrees Fahrenheit for 28 hours without stopping. Aurora withstood the day, despite the damage received. And once it was dark, the cruiser managed to break through the tight encirclement of the enemy destroyers and shake off their pursuit. In that situation, Admiral Enqvist, the commander of the cruiser squadron, made the absolutely correct decision not to break through to Vladivostok. By returning to Manila, Enqvist saved the ships for Russia. Named after the goddess of the dawn and starry sky, the cruiser was fortunate from the very beginning to be among the ten surviving ships 
and return home after the Battle of Tsushima. Doesn't that prove that Aurora was born under a lucky star? Almost the entire battle corps of the Russian fleet was destroyed, and even ships that were considered obsolete, like Aurora and Diana, which had survived the Russian-Japanese war, could still be useful to the fleet. In 1909, cruiser Aurora became a training ship and entered the First World War with that status. Aurora was part of the second cruiser squadron of the Baltic fleet. Its main mission was to not let the Imperial German Navy reach St. Petersburg. So, laying the minefield in the Gulf of Finland was a priority task. The cruiser's job was to patrol these minefields and support destroyers. That's all. So Aurora fulfilled those tasks from the very beginning. But it should be noted that the ship was already outdated by 1914, 1915, 1916. It was in constant need of repairs. The steam engine had to be completely replaced. In this condition, Aurora met the February Revolution in Russia, and she was almost in the same condition during the October Revolution. During the revolutionary events of 1917, the sailors of the Baltic fleet, Aurora in particular, played an almost decisive role in the Bolsheviks' victory. This active participation of the sailors was determined by a number of factors. Sailors were extremely bored on the ship, and they were wondering why the war was happening, what they were fighting for, why things in society work this or that way. Their officers could have answered those questions if they had talked to their sailors and taken interest in those issues themselves. In Tsarist Russia, the naval officers were mostly from nobility. They wouldn't come down to the engine room, and they controlled the work of the personnel by looking through the internal portholes. This corridor maintained its historical look. Riveted bulkheads and internal portholes from 1900, they've survived to the present day. By 1917, there was a rift between the officers and the rank and file, and the Bolsheviks used this for their own benefit. A sailor serving on the ship was a peasant who entered another environment, but the folks up top remained the same. The nobility, the officer corps. A peasant who became a sailor fought on his action station for his action station and his ship. Reporting to a nobleman, an officer, they required strict discipline that was propagated in all leading fleets. As soon as the ship docks, the sailors have free time. What did free time mean for a sailor in the early 1900s? It was anything but combat training. Leaflet propaganda. Aurora was anchored near a factory wall, where there were plenty of workers, so it was natural for the crew to get involved in the revolutionary movement. And when the revolution began on February 23, 1917, the Aurora sailors supported it. On February 28, the Aurora crew came ashore. The sailors tried to make the cruise commander, Captain First Rank Nikolsky, carry the red flag. He refused and was murdered. While there are many versions of Nikolsky's death, one of them is that Nikolsky forbade the sailors take part in the demonstration that was held on the shore. And when he came out on the main deck saying, halt, don't move, I'm not letting you go, the sailors revolted. 
The rebels should be shot. That was the rule. When he opened fire, he didn't even think it might end badly for him. He thought he would shoot one or two mutineers and things would calm down. But things had already progressed to a revolution mentality. By October 1917, Aurora was a completely revolutionary ship. On October the 25th, the cruiser stood in the fairway of the Neva River, near Nikolaevsky Bridge. At 21.45, her bow gun fired a shot which began the October Revolution. One of the myths about the legendary cruiser Aurora is that she fired at the Winter Palace during the Revolution. The Winter Palace was a government building at the time, so it would have been like firing at Buckingham Palace from the Thames or at the White House from the center of Washington. The very next day, after the assault on the Winter Palace, newspapers wrote that Aurora was firing combat shells at a government building, the Winter Palace. As a matter of fact, a combat shot could not have happened. When passed for repairs, a ship of any nation gets disarmed, so it was a blank shot. But this myth, born by mass media, remains alive till today. In the summer of 1918, guns were removed from Aurora and sent to the front line of the Russian Civil War. However, four months before the ship was placed into reserves, she was one step away from destruction. An explosive device was found in one of the ship's magazines. It was neutralized by Aurora's chief artillery officer, Lieutenant Winter. The bomb detonated right in his hands, and the officer was injured. This accident shows that back then, cruiser Aurora was already perceived as a symbol. However, despite her merits for the revolution, Aurora had every chance to get scrapped. The young Soviet Republic had no funds to promptly rebuild its fleet. Of the two cruisers of this type, Aurora and Diana, the former had an important advantage. She had been overhauled. As a result, Diana was scrapped, and Aurora returned to service as a training ship. The next time the Navy thought about decommissioning the cruiser was in the early 1940s, but then a new war reared its head. In September 1941, German troops were breaking through to Leningrad, renamed St. Petersburg. Every cannon and every soldier were integral. And again, Aurora's guns were removed from the ship and placed in the suburbs of the city. What is done within a month in peacetime, they did within a day. Bringing a crane to Aurora, removing her guns, placing them on a flat car, taking them to their positions. And the positions themselves are pretty sophisticated fortifications. What is a fortified position? It's a place where you have to sort of recreate a ship deck. So they dug special pits and cast concrete inside. And this concrete served as a ship deck. They brought these huge heavy guns in by hand, placed them on these platforms and fastened them, removing, delivering and installing the guns. It was all equally heroic. Together with the guns, seamen left the cruiser to fight on the ground. Aurora's main battery fought at Dudyahov Hills. The crew showed themselves to be heroes, and almost all of them fell defending the city. The guns were installed just in time for the defense of Leningrad itself. The German 4th tank group was at the tip of the spear, and Battery A, composed of guns and seamen from cruiser Aurora, stood in her way. The sailors fulfilled their duty. They accomplished their mission. So it was a feat of Aurora's seamen, of the cruiser herself. This is how the ship took part in the defense of Leningrad. The cannons from Aurora were fighting not only at Dudyahov Hills. The aft gun was taken from the ship's deck straight to armored train Baltiets. The cruiser herself was fighting German aircraft in the port of Oranienbaum. Seriously damaged by enemy air bombs and artillery shells, Aurora was run aground, but still continued to defend the sky of Leningrad 
from German aviation. Though Aurora was sitting on the ground, she remained in the ranks throughout the entire war, and her flying flag was a symbol of this. The flag showed that Aurora was in the ranks. Aurora was fighting. She was fulfilling her duty. As Aurora was beginning her fifth decade in service, she was already considered a legendary ship in the Soviet Navy. For this reason, even before World War II was over, a decision was taken to preserve the ship as a monument of military history and the revolution. The ship was brought afloat, handed over to the Nahimov Naval School, and anchored in front of the historic Peter the Great Palace, which hosts the school. In the 1960s, the Soviet government decided to make Aurora a symbol of the October Revolution and created this image of a cruiser giving the signal to start the uprising. This is when they created the famous picture with Aurora and her searchlight cutting through the darkness. Commissioned in 1903, cruiser Aurora could have been destroyed in the Battle of Tsushima, could have gotten sunk by a German submarine during World War I, or could have been scrapped after the Russian Revolution and the Civil War. In World War II, she could have gotten destroyed by German aircraft or artillery, but the cruiser is still in service. Doesn't that prove that she's not only the most legendary, but also the luckiest ship in the history of the Russian Navy? And now, having celebrated her 113th birthday, Aurora has returned to her place at the Petrograd embankment as a symbol of St. Petersburg and the history of the Russian Navy.